So good afternoon, everybody. Good day. Uh, today, I will be speaking about uh, the glory that was old Manila. So I would have, uh, I will be discussing the following. First, I'll explain the origin of the name uh, Manila. And then I will explain uh, the challenges that the city faced throughout uh, the period of the Spanish uh, colonial colonization, meaning from 1571 until around 1898. And then I will explain the cosmopolitan flavor of the city. I will also describe um, a little bit of the everyday life of Old Manila. And then I'll explain why uh, Manila is um, a timeless topic, which does not um, become irrelevant. It's always relevant. No? Okay. So uh, first, um, the name Manila, no? so Manila. This comes actually from a plant, no? which uh, is referred to by Father Manuel Blanco in his uh, Flora de Manila uh, as Ixora Manila. So this is what is called uh, the Nila uh, plant. No? Um, so there was some debate about the name Manila, but I think it's um, without a doubt uh, uh, from the plant itself because there are many places in the Philippines, there are many toponyms that are actually um, taken from um, the plants and uh, the, um, the greenery that would be found in a specific place. So in this case, Manila um, had a lot of the Nila plant. And so it, in Tagalog, if you say my Nila, this means there are a lot of Nila plants in the, in the place. So I would like to believe that this is the real uh, origin of, uh, of the, the name Manila unlike uh, the other explanations given by other scholars i think this is the most uh, uh, is the most evidence based no um, reason for calling it manila okay manila is a very old city um, contrary to what people uh, may sometimes think uh, manila was very important even before the spaniards came but it was not the capital of the Philippines for the simple reason that there was no such thing as Philippines at that time, no? at the time that the Spaniards came. The concept of a nation state or even the term Filipinas was given to us by the Spaniards. But Manila is a very old settlement. It may not be the capital of Filipinas, which is yet to be formed at that time, but it was a considerable settlement. It was considered um, a big enough settlement so that it would have actually three um, co-rulers. No, So you would have three co-rulers of Manila. But um, what I'm trying to say is even before uh, this uh, these three co-rulers, this is uh, Suleiman, Raja Suleiman, uh, Lakandula, and then Raja Matanda. Even before that, towards um, around the 12th to the 13th, maybe even the 14th century, there was such a settlement or a chiefdom, I would rather use the term chiefdom, uh, called Namayan, which uh, is more or less located uh, in the present Santa Ana. No? Santa Ana. And Namayan is considered to be um, an important settlement because um, archaeologists believe that it controlled the traffic in the Pasig River and collected fees for ships to go up and down uh, the Pasig River, which was highly navigable at that time. Unlike today, probably it is not as nav navigable, but for maybe about 400, 500 years ago, it was very navigable. So Namayan uh, is considered an important settlement that controlled uh, traffic until it declined somewhere around uh, the 15th century. And there is no clear reason why it, it declined, but the one of the possibilities is that it was Manila that replaced Namayan as the most powerful uh, settlement at that time, which also was located at the mouth of the Pasig River and controlled the traffic and so became um, more uh, a 
more powerful in the sense that it eclipses the it eclipses the control of traffic in the river, which used to be uh, controlled by Namayan. So, having said that, I hope uh, you would be able to see that it is not just the coming of the Spaniards that made uh, Manila or the, uh, what is going to be called the city of Manila as important, but even our uh, pre-Hispanic uh, ancestors had uh, considered the location of Manila strategic to the point that it was already considered one of the largest settlements in the island of Luzon. So I think you know the story. When the Spaniards arrived, they did not arrive in Manila first. They arrived in uh, the Visayas. No? So, um, but because of the lack of food supply, uh, the, the, the places in the Visayas, Cebu, Iloilo, could not support uh, the population of the Spaniards. The Spaniards decided to search for um, 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 a more hospitable place in the sense that it can supply food, especially meat, no? to the Spaniards for their everyday needs. And so he sent uh, Martin de Goiti to scout around because they had heard reports that there's a big settlement in Luzon that um, was most likely the better place to settle instead of settling in Cebu or Iloilo. And so that's exactly what happened. So Miguel uh, Martin de Goiti uh, went and saw Manila, Manila as it is called, a palisaded uh, settlement. So if it's palisaded, it means that it has some kind of a, some kind of a, um, earthen walls, earthen walls uh, surrounded it, which would be supported by bamboo. You no, know? so it's it offered some kind of a protection at the time. And uh, so therefore, even at the time of uh, the arrival of the Spaniards, there was some kind of protection that would uh, cover portions of the settlement called Mainida. But then uh, to make the story short, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi thought that the location was perfect. It had a commanding view of Manila Bay and uh, the surrounding areas were uh, full of trees full of uh, fruits and they have seen uh, certain areas um, devoted to agriculture and there's a lot of fish in the bay and so this was the perfect uh, place to to settle and uh, therefore he in in uh, on june 24 1571 he made uh, manila the capital of the philippines and appointed the cabildo the different officials in government and so this started, or this is what is called the foundation of the city. So Manila, which uh, has a very long history, faced many, many challenges. In fact, only a few years after the foundation of Manila as a city and making it as the capital, the first challenge was, uh, was made by, by a corsair, no? by a Chinese corsair, Lin Feng, sometimes called uh, in some sources as Lima Hong. So maybe that's a more popular name for this Corsair. And he wanted to take over Manila. Actually, he almost did. He almost captured Manila, if not for the timely arrival of Juan de Salcedo, uh, who brought with him around 50 soldiers coming from Ilocos, which probably saved Manila from um, an outright takeover from the Chinese. But this is just the beginning. This is 1574. Uh, but through the centuries, you would have many, many challenges to Manila, not just that. And please remember that in the first decades, the first two decades of Manila's life as the capital of the Philippines, uh, there were no walls. This, this whole thing of Intramuros was not, was not um, constructed until 1890, I'm sorry, 1590 to about 1594. So if Manila was made the capital in 1571, so it, it took more than two decades to construct the walls and the walls were not constructed in one day. It had to take several years for uh, the Spaniards together with the assistance of a large number of natives to construct the walls 
and protect help to protect the city from invaders like Limahong. In fact, I think the direct uh, the clear reason for the decision to put up walls around Manila is because of the because of the um, the very close attempt to conquer uh, by Limahong. So aside from the Chinese uh, the Chinese attack uh, by Limahong, uh, many centuries after, around the 17th century, around 1663, another Chinese was going to attack Manila. In fact, he even said, if you don't um, pay uh, homage to me, this is Kosinga, no? another, another uh, um, so-called uh, pirate. No? He's labeled by some sources as a pirate, others uh, labeled as a kind of uh, leader um, who would be authorized by the emperor to wreak havoc around uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Kosinga also threatened to, to occupy Manila if uh, the Spaniards did not um, accept his rule over them. Thankfully, for um, very, very unclear reasons up to now, Kosinga simply fell dead. And um, so because he died, then the whole threat to Manila by, from him did not take place. And so this is an example of Chinese threats to Manila. There were many others. Now, this is what makes the, the story of Manila so interesting because um, after every threat, Manila is able to survive the threats and the challenges to its existence, which makes its existence its history even more um, interesting, richer, uh, dramatic, no? Um, um, it's worthy of being portrayed in, uh, in films, but I don't know whether our scriptwriters have uh, been able to mine the rich history of Manila to become, uh, you know, the basis of a very good script for film. But aside from the Chinese, the Chinese threat, you would have the Dutch threats. The Dutch throughout the 17th century, this begins from 1600, all throughout until I think about uh, six, the middle of the first half of the 17th century. So this is around 1646, 1650. The threat of the Dutch uh, to take over and to capture the Philippines was very real. So can you imagine if the Dutch succeeded in capturing Manila, then our history would be entirely different. Um, we would not be start having uh, or saying uh, after the Spanish colonial period, we would have a Dutch colonial period. And probably, I don't know if we would be speaking Dutch, but certainly our history would be different. So there were many attempts, no? not just one, but many. Uh, 1600, 1609, 1617, 1619, no? uh, all the way up to 1646. And the most famous of all of these threats was made in 1646 in the so-called the Battle of Lanabad, because this is the famous story of the so-called miracle. It's not so-called, but it's declared by the Roman Catholic Church as actually a miracle. It is not uh, imagined. It is not um, something that had simply been declared. They sent uh, people to investigate and to check and recheck the events that happened. And in the end, the Catholic Church actually declared the Lanaval battles as a genuine miracle. And the miracles were attributed to no less than Nuestra Señora de Santísimo Rosario de la Naval. And so for, she is referred to as La Naval. And this figure is one of the oldest, considered one of the oldest icons in Manila and is now found in Santo Domingo Church in Quezon City. There was even a time when the Dutch had actually joined forces with another, um, another power that wanted to control the Philippines. And this would be the English. No? The English. So imagine uh, two forces combining against uh, Manila. 
against uh, the Spaniards. No? And they formed a blockade. They formed a blockade in order to prevent um, ships from trading with Manila. This is around 1620, 1621, 1622. And uh, all in all, even if the people in Manila, the Spaniards had a difficult time, the Indios also had a difficult time, uh, this attempts to capture Manila all failed. No? So you can, you can imagine that, that uh, God was on our side. No? God was on the side of Manila. She did not let Manila be captured by uh, the English nor the Dutch. But the story doesn't end there. Because after the English, after the Dutch and the English combination, no? uh, putting together their, uh, their um, um, ships in order to blockade Manila, um, the following century, this is the 18th century, the British actually succeeded. So finally, after uh, centuries of trying, the British finally succeeded in occupying Manila. And this is for about uh, almost three years, from 1762 to about 1764. And this is the so-called British occupation of Manila. But after a, uh, a treaty settlement in uh, Europe, the British withdrew and returned um, Manila to Spain, no? returned uh, the Philippines to Spain, so to speak. Um, but the threats did not stop there because in between all of this, in between all of these um, Chinese threats, you would have the Dutch threats, you have the English threats, you also have the Chinese uh, immigrant population in the Philippines. Immigrant population, meaning those Chinese uh, who left their homeland and settled in the Philippines to work here. There were many revolts of this Chinese uh, in the 6th, 17th century. And every time there's a Chinese revolt, the existence of Manila is always threatened. No? Why? Very simple. One, because the Spaniards are outnumbered. There are only a very small number of Spaniards in the Philippines. So the Spaniards needed the help of the Indios so that without the help of the Indios, the, 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 um, the Chinese uh, uh, immigrants who would revolt against the Spanish colonial government would have been successful. So every time that there would be a Chinese revolt, um, the Spaniards called, uh, called in soldiers from uh, the Ilocos, uh, soldiers from Cagayan, soldiers from the Visayas, and of course the Tagalogs. No? And the Tagalog region was the most Hispanized of all the regions. It was the first to be evangelized, meaning to be converted to Christianity. And uh, so therefore, it also became the first to be Hispanized in the sense that they began to learn uh, many things uh, about uh, not only Christianity, but also began to absorb uh, Spanish influences, not necessarily the Spanish language. But there are a lot of uh, Spanish terms that have entered our vocabulary, our Tagalog vocabulary. Practically, almost all our nouns, our adjectives, uh, and our verbs are all Spanish. And so even if we do not speak Spanish, not a large number of Filipinos would speak Spanish, but you can see the very heavy uh, influence, about 40%, according to some linguistic studies, 40% of the Tagalog or the Filipino uh, vocabulary would come from Spanish. No? So aside from uh, all of this, if you think that the story ended there, that the threats ended there, no, that's not, uh, that's not enough. That's not the full story. So aside from the Chinese um, Corsair threat, then you have the Dutch uh, threats. You would have the, um, uh, the, the Chinese revolts in the Philippines. You would have the Indios also fighting the Spaniards. And so therefore, uh, because of the, because of the uh, revolts of the Indios, you would have uh, uh, so many, many uh, uh, times that, uh, you know, the Spaniards were actually, uh, you know, uh, they were not so sure that 
that uh, they would actually survive. But then uh, the, the, the thing is, what is so interesting is that none of these uh, revolts of the Indios, of the Chinese immigrants, of the Chinese uh, pirates, of the Dutch, of the English, none of them had actually succeeded. And so therefore, Manila continued its very interesting, interesting history, despite and in spite the serious threats to it, it had actually survived. And so that's, uh, that's the second point that I wanted to talk about regarding life old Manila, the glory of old Manila. Why were all of these uh, foreigners uh, wanting to capture Manila? The answer to that is very clear because of the fable, because of the very, very famous stories that would be associated with what is called the galleon trade. Because the galleon trade is supposed to have uh, brought so many riches, a lot of gold, a lot of wealth into Manila. So this uh, reputation of the galleon trade had become so widespread that many, um, many people, many uh, uh, other leaders wanted to control uh, the Philippines. And together with the galleon trade, which incidentally is the longest and the most historic trade route in the whole history of world navigation, uh, together with that would be brought so many other influences into the Philippines, which brings me to my third point. No? Who are the people living in Manila? No? Uh, it's not just you and me, no? our ancestors who lived there, not just Indios. Of course, it's understood that Indios lived in Manila. But you, did you know that Manila had a very cosmopolitan population? When I say cosmopolitan, I mean that there is a very uh, wide range of uh, people, different races lived in Manila, even from the beginning, from the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th, and even the 19th century. No? Uh, there were many groups of people living in Manila. And for that, we should look at some of the illustrations that had been made by uh, the famous uh, Jesuit uh, cartographer, Father Murillo Velarde, who uh, portrayed some of these people, some of this uh, international, uh, what I call the international community in uh, Manila, in old Manila, uh, in some of the some of the illustrations no, that were that form part of the original map of Murillo Velarde. So who are these people? Where, well, of course, I already mentioned our ancestors who are Indios natural, I naturales. This is how they are referred to in the records, Indios I naturales. Then you, are, of course, have the Chinese immigrants, many of whom had actually chosen to uh, accept Christianity. And some of them, by accepting Christianity, also intermarried with the local women. And so therefore, they produce what is called the Chinese mestizos. And aside from the Chinese mestizos, you have the Spanish mestizos. Um, usually the mothers are Indias and the fathers are Spaniards. Then you have Creoles. The Creoles are Spaniards. They are pure-blooded Spaniards, but they are born outside of Spain. No? So this is what the Creoles would mean. But who are the other people who lived in Manila? Why did I say that this is a very cosmopolitan city? You would be surprised. You would have a lot of Africans living in Manila. Africans, no, especially from Mozambique. No, Mozambique is in the southeastern portion of Africa. Why are they in the Philippines? Because there was an ongoing slave trade at that time. Remember that slavery would be outlawed in the Philippines only around the 17th century. So from the beginning of Manila's foundation as the capital of the Philippines, under Miguel Lopez de Legazpi until the 17th century, there was a lot of, uh, because slavery was not illegal, it was not outlawed, there were many, um, uh, people who dealt with uh, the traffic and the buying and selling of slaves, especially the Portuguese and uh, some of the British. And so uh, these African slaves were brought uh, to the Philippines and some of them served um, as 
what el what else as slaves some of them served in the galleons some of them served as personal servants some of them served in the hospitals i i saw i have seen records referring to san juan de dios uh, in the 17th century and they have um, men and women slaves that would help uh, uh, to serve uh, the patients in San Juan de Dios Hospital, which was considered the general hospital at that time. Aside from the Africans who are from Mozambique, there are other Africans coming from different parts, no? especially from Central Africa, no? the, the ones on the Eastern portion, because that was in the root of uh, the, the, the ships, the, the maritime route was there. And so it's, it's, very, um, it's very strategic. And that's also where a large number of the slaves who were brought across the Atlantic Ocean to enter what is to be called the United States of America would originate from. So countries like Cameroon, Togo. No? So you have uh, some of them also mingling with others and some of them were also brought to Manila. So aside from the Africans, you would have a lot of a lot of different Asians living in the Philippines, also because of trade. Trade and uh, the galleon trade was, was one of the reasons for that. Um, uh, you would have uh, Indians from the Coromandel and the Malabar coasts. This would be from the west, southwestern and the southeastern coasts of India. Some of them are also referred to as Laskars, which are actually Indian uh, mariners or Indian sailors. The term used for them would be Laskars, L-A-S-C-A-R-S, -S -S, Laskars. Then you would have uh, a lot of people from uh, Goa. Goa is a Portuguese uh, city, but it's in India. And there are a lot of uh, Portuguese mestizos who would also uh, come uh, to live in uh, the Philippines. Also Portuguese, especially because they were Catholics. No, some of them had actually uh, come to the Philippines. You would have Bengals, no people from Beng Bengal. No, then you would have, of course, uh, the people from Southeast Asia. You have Malays. You would have uh, Thais. You would have people from. Uh, um, uh, what we call today as Indonesia, you would also have a lot of Armenians who were trading in uh, uh, precious stones, Armenians. Then you would also have uh, not only that, but uh, some of them are depicted no, as uh, Persians, Persians meaning coming from the country today referred to as Iran. So you would have this group of Asians, not so many of them, coming to live in, in Manila so that some visitors would say that uh, um, if you go uh, to, the, to the bridge, you would see a whole range of nationalities passing by. This is the description given by a British uh, traveler who came to Manila around the, eight, uh, the 18th century. Now, aside from all of these Africans uh, and Asians, you of course have English, uh, you have Dutch, you have French, you have um, Germans, you have uh, Belgians, you have eventually, especially around the 18th and the 19th centuries, you have Americans, meaning from the United States of America, coming to the Philippines and trading here and some of them living here. So you have Dutch uh, people coming to Manila to, uh, to trade, some of them opened uh, trading houses and that's the reason why uh, because the trade with Manila was increasing in the 19th century they also some of these European countries also started to open um, embassies or at least consular offices in Manila so this don't you think that makes Manila so interesting um, one uh, traveler observed that he has never seen so many foreigners in 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 one city and then I remember another traveler uh, who attended a get together, a party, a reception of some kind in the house of a prominent uh, Filipino. He uh, um, observed that during the party, uh, there are people belonging to different races that are all standing in the same room. And then he made the interesting comment that um, I cannot imagine, he says, that this, the presence of people of different races would be possible in London 
or even in Paris, he says. So in other words, Manila was really cosmopolitan. We are ahead of our time, of their time because they were for segregation. Uh, whites are only uh, mingling with uh, their the people of the same color. But in Manila, we are color blind. We accepted everybody. And so to see a lot of foreigners in the Philippines today is uh, goes back, harks back to our history. Um, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, 19th centuries, when there were so many foreigners living in Manila. So I think that's what makes uh, life in old Manila quite interesting. That's the third point that I wanted to discuss. And I, I now come to uh, my second to the last point, which is uh, what was life like in um, old Manila life? What, I, mean, I mean, everyday life, the mundane things, no? How do people, uh, what do people do? What are some of the, the way that people earn a living? Well, I'll tell you some of them, at least. And uh, to me, the most, one of the most fascinating would be the lecheros and the lecheras. So don't think that I am saying something bad, no? I'm simply describing men and women who are selling fresh milk, leche, no? Leche is not a bad word. I don't know why it became pejorative, but no, leche is milk and fresh milk is delivered to the doorstep of, of people who live in uh, Intramuros and other Arrabales or districts outside Intramuros. So every very early in the morning, when it's still dark, according to the records, no? Uh, the lecheros and the lecheras would already, you know, knock on the doors of some houses and uh, with, uh, you know, a, an earthen pot on their heads and they, they are carrying a cup for measuring, a measuring cup, so that uh, they sell the fresh milk by the cup. So they have to measure that, pour it, and then, you know, deliver it uh, to that house, which would uh, be uh, consuming the fresh milk for breakfast. Or for use it use this for cooking. So lecheros y lecheras, no. I don't know. Uh, somehow, in the process of uh, you know, as time went uh, by, this this uh, way of earning a living disappeared because when eventually when the uh, Americans came, uh, uh, they also brought uh, they also imported uh, cows into the Philippines, and so. Um, uh, it, the fresh milk did not need to come from the carabaos or from uh, uh, goat's milk. No, it doesn't have to. It, it, it really came from uh, European cows. But that was during the American period. That's after the Spanish colonial period. And so therefore, the work of the lecheros and the lecheras was quite interesting because um, it meant that you get fresh milk every day, but it's not necessarily cow's milk. No? Okay, so that's one way of earning your living, uh, to become a lechero or a lechera. Second, you have people who delivered uh, water. You heard me, water. Because there was no plumbing, there was no, you know, waterworks. Waterworks would not come to Manila until around some time around 1880. Two, I think, no? The Carriedo Waterworks would be the first, uh, the first attempt of the Spanish colonial government to um, uh, uh, construct plumbing and deliver, try to deliver fresh water to the different houses. And so you would have, you know, for the first time, you would have running water only, uh, 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 only beginning uh, in the year 1882 and uh, thereafter. But before that, all water had to be delivered by aguadores. And so the term for them would be aguadores. Agua meaning water. And then aguador meaning you are the person who delivers fresh water. And so a lot of these are actually Chinese laborers. They're also Indios, no? But according to um, 
the records, no? again, uh, from the evidence, some of them would go a very, very long way in order to get fresh water from a spring or from uh, a waterfall, which is outside of Intramuros. Some of them, uh, San Juan, no? San Juan, San Juan City today. San Juan is famous for a spring. And so some of them would go all the way, walk all the way to San Juan, uh, get uh, fill up the containers with the water, and then bring them, hold them all the way to Intramuros or some of the other Arabades to deliver the water for bathing, for drinking, for personal use, for everything, and uh, get paid. And so that's also another interesting uh, way to earn a living in Old Manila, the Aguadores. And together with the Aguadores, you would have the Labanderas. I think you know what it means. But there are also Labanderos. Did you know that? Um, men also um, washed um, clothes for a living, although they were definitely outnumbered by the fairer gender. Women had, were more numerous as Labanderas compared to the men who would wash clothes. And so this is another way of earning a living. Uh, by the common people in old Manila, in ancient Manila. And so you would have women go to different houses, take the clothes, bundle them up, put them on their heads, go to the river, wash them near the river, and then hang them up uh, in uh, clothes lines or uh, put them around bushes or trees to dry. And when they are dry, they would bundle them up again and bring them back to the house. Uh, where uh, they got it in the first place. And so every day you would see, that's why you would see along uh, some rivers, uh, you would see women gathered together, washing clothes. Some of them do this um, as a means of earning a living. So la banderos and the banderas, another way of earning a living. No? For the men, you would have the cocheros. Ah, okay. Cochero. Not the coche. A cochero is the, the man that takes charge of uh, driving the carriage, the calesa, the carretela, and the carriages, different types of carriages, wheeled vehicles that are pulled by horses, sometimes a single horse, two horses. Uh, if, if the person is rich, it would be as many as four horses. The, the many, uh, the, the many, uh, the larger the number of horses, uh, the, the, the higher the stature of the person riding the carriage. So you can imagine that the governor general would have a whole, you know, a whole uh, retinue of uh, soldiers escorting him. And then his own carriage would have several sets of horses. No? Do you understand? So the cochero plays a very important role. No? Many families, those who can afford uh, to have their own carriages, those who are wealthy would have their own cochero living in with them. So it's like the family driver today, but what they drive would be the carriage instead of the car. Now, aside from this, you also would have a lot of ambulant vendors, no? ambulant vendors. And so you would have women uh, selling fish, selling uh, vegetables. This is usual. Up to now, this is done, especially during these times because of the pandemic. You know, a lot of people go around um, to sell so many of these things. So it's like a revival of old Manila. No? Even in uh, the city now, you can see people... Um, uh, saying uh, vegetables for sale, no? They shout vegetables for sale or different types of fish uh, for sale, which is a revival of the way of life of old Manila. So uh, it's a case of uh, it's a case of you know uh, not exactly history repeating itself, but it is a, a very very close parallelism, no? Okay. So aside from the ambulant vendors, there are people who also sell their services not things because there are also uh, um, vendors who would sell toys there are vendors who would sell um you know things for the house you know um cooking pans and so on no? and then you have um cooking utensils knives but there are people who sell services and who are these usually these are chinese uh, uh chinese 
uh, immigrants, what do they do? They cut hair for the men. They shave, no? they clean the ears. They even cut nails, uh, toenails and uh, fingernails, you know? Uh, and so you can imagine that, uh, that uh, they create a very interesting uh, site along, uh, you know, um, adding to the color and the texture of life in Old Manila. So you can imagine this man carrying what? Carrying uh, uh, a stool. Usually he brings his own stool, you know, a stool. And then he would have a kind of... Uh, bag where uh, the cape you know you put the cape so that for the for the hair no and then he would have uh, the tiny uh you know sticks for cleaning the ears no? and then you would have uh small scissors for cutting the fingernails and then cutting uh the toenails so this is another character that plied the streets that you find in the streets of manila but then you would have also adding to the color, adding to the colorful human landscape of Manila would be the students who are going to uh, places like institutions like Colegio de San Juan de Letran, Ateneo Municipal, especially in the 19th century. But Colegio de San Juan de Letran was already existing in the 17th century. Huh? So it's a very old uh, school. It's the oldest uh, secondary school in the Philippines, by the way. And so uh, aside from uh, San, uh, San Juan de Letran, of course, you have the Colegio de Santo Tomas, which is different from the university. The university is a tertiary level institution, but the Colegio de Santo Tomas is a secondary school. And this was training students to become priests. So it's a, it's a kind of seminary also, Colegio Seminario. No? So you have these students. Why do I mention these students? Because the students at that time, what, what the students wear? Well, some, many, many institutions now require their students to wear uniforms. And the color of the uniform uh, marks, uh, identifies the student as belonging to, let us say, uh, uh, um, uh, Adamson University or uh, Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Maynila, PLM. But at that time, the students wore um, the togas. No, it's not really the uniform like what we have now, but togas, long. It's like an academic gown with a with a kind of uh, 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 stole. No, here and they they wore this every day, every day, and they have uh, special hats that identified them as colegiales or students of the institutions like. Letran, like Santo Tomas, and eventually by the 19th century, you would have Ateneo Municipal because Ateneo was uh, opened uh, in 1859. But before that, the Jesuits were in charge of the Colegio de San Jose before 1768. So you can imagine the color of uh, Santo Tomas, uh, the uh, toga is, is actually uh, green. And uh, then you have uh, the stole, which is like uh, red. So green and red, can you imagine that? So you can, you can imagine that these students who are uh, very many, especially around the 19th century, it's just like uh, Manila now being the center of education, having a large number of students uh, before the pandemic. No? Now, uh, they, Manila still has a large number of students, but since classes are conducted virtually, then you don't see them in the in the streets as much. But Manila still is the center of education uh, at that time, all the way up to the present. So they added to the color full human landscape, like what I said before. Then you can imagine uh, that uh, the religious orders, the different religious orders. So you would have the Augustinian, uh, the Augustinians. You would have the Dominicans, you would have the Franciscans with their brown robes and then their rope uh, tied here. You would have the uh, Jesuits no, you, with their black uh, um, habits. And then you would have the Recollects. So you, these are the five major religious orders during that time. So you can imagine many of them walking uh, in, the, in the streets of Intramuros and even outside in the Arabales towards Pinondo. So they added to the human landscape. 
And uh, aside from that, um, you would also have the buyera. Buyera is B-U-Y-E-R-A-S. Buyo, no? Buyo, which means uh, the combination of the lime, areca leaves, and betel nut. No? So you would have buyo. That's why she sells the combination uh, of this uh, areca leaves, lime, and uh, betel nut. And this becomes uh, uh, the chew. No? So the buyera combines them in perfect proportion. And then the, she has a table and she sells this um, to the passersby. And usually she has... Uh, regular patrons, no, mostly male, but women also chew the buyo at that time. So this is another thing that has actually ceased to exist. And so you can imagine that life in Manila was very interesting, especially probably for kids who would be mesmerized by, you know, the expert combination of the leaves, the lime, the betel nut, and then wrapping it up and then popping it into your mouth chewing it and making all your teeth red because the combination makes the teeth red. And so you, sometimes it is spat out, no? So you see that it's red, no? So that's another thing that made uh, Old Manila very interesting. To me, uh, this is, a, this is a, a vanished uh, uh, way of living. It's no more. And so we can uh, imagine them, no, through... Uh, uh, the, the photographs, the illustrations made by some artists uh, of uh, the life in Old Manila. Then you would have the banquero. The banquero is like the driver, but he is driving the banca. Because at that time, travel around Manila was not always done on land because um, roads were not uh, very well paved. Some of them are simply dust roads. And so the best way to travel and uh, the faster way to travel, especially before the, uh, the onset of or the arrival of automobiles in the 20th century was to travel by boat. And so the rivers, the esteros, the canals provided natural highways that brought one person from Binondo, for example, if you are from uh, Dulumbayan, what is Dulumbayan? Dulumbayan is like uh, the location of the Hospital de San Lazaro in Santa Cruz. That is already called Dulumbayan because that's considered the edge of uh, the settlement. Beyond that, it would be uh, forest. You understand? So it's called Dulumbayan. If you want to travel from Dulumbayan all the way to uh, Quiapo, for example, how do you travel? The, the fastest way to travel is to take the boat because there are esteros, there are canals, there are rivulets, small uh, rivers that would pass through there, which and many of these have, have actually vanished. And maybe that's why we, why we are so flood prone today because many of them have been filled up and they have simply vanished. But the banquero is a very popular guy because, you know, if he is very strong, then he can navigate through the shallows, through the rocks, and then bring you to your destination and uh, on time. No? So many of the women, they, they uh, you know, it's like uh, hailing the taxi, but, you know, it's a water taxi. So it's a banca that goes through the canals. No? So don't you think that's interesting? I, I, I think it would be, be nice to try it out. No? And then you would have the beatas. The beatas are those dedicated, no, who live in a community. These are holy women who dedicate their lives to praying and de devoting, giving service to uh, to God. And uh, very early in the morning, 4.30 or 4 o'clock, they go in one line with their black, um, you know, black uh, cloaks and uh, their... Um, uh, the mantas, as they say, no, uh, uh, the bello, no, as they say, the veils, uh, and then they go to hear mass very early. And so, if you rise, rise early, you, you get up early, you will see them, you know, you will see them file one by one into Santo Domingo Church, into San Agustin Church, no, the Manila Cathedral, and this was the the kind of life that people had. Uh, 
in in old manila no very early in the morning and then what about entertainment what about uh how do people meet each other well there are of course a lot of uh, a lot of parties one kind of party or one kind of reception is called a tertulia and this tertulia is is mostly a literary gathering so there is a literary reading so someone will read poems maybe someone would read not just poems but passages from a novel or a short story and then in between these literary readings there would be musical performances and so you have people inviting good friends no, over for merienda for an afternoon tertulia which and Rizal had attended a lot of these tertulias you should read his diary he says that and he says in Manila there is no uh, there is no uh, lacking uh, the tertulias that pe that you get invited to so in other words many people actually do this and this is the place where young men and young women meet each other of course no so that makes it really really interesting don't you think i'm sure people went not only for the readings but also to meet uh or to get the chance or to be able to see the person they were interested in so don't you think that's interesting then you have uh, the theater there are there are several theaters no uh through the years some of them are huge theaters like the teatro zorilla very large some of them can house uh, hundreds of people others can can accommodate as much as 2000 people can you imagine since there is no move there are no movies at that time then the major means of entertainment would be the theater especially during fiestas no the fiestas of quiapo the fiesta of santa cruz the, the fiesta of uh, intramuros no which is november 30 because san andres is actually the patron saint of Manila. And so November 30 is a very important date in the history of Manila, especially because uh, the attack of Limahong occurred um, around uh, the Feast of San Andres. And they believe that San Andres had actually saved Manila from the Chinese. No? Then uh, towards the, uh, the latter part of the 19th century, you would have new forms of transportation. One of these new forms of transportation would be the Tranvia. No, the tranvia the old tranvias were pulled by horses later on when technology had developed uh, much much more uh, in advanced way uh, it now would be powered by steam and uh, later on by electricity so all of this uh, would be new ways of traveling the the steam uh, the, the trains the railways were developed around 1891 and remember that Rizal took the train from Tutuban Station all the way up to San Fernando, Pampanga, Cabanatuan, Nueva Ecija, Malolos, Bulacan to campaign for uh, membership in La Liga Filipina. So again, another form of transportation. Do you know that there are uh, corridas de toros in Manila, especially around the 16th, 17th, and even up to the 18th centuries, there, was, there were corridas, there were bullfights. Yes, you heard me, bullfights. They are not held often, but they were held, definitely, they were held. This is one of those, again, another of the vanished uh, forms of entertainment in old manila which no longer vanished so they no longer exist but there were corridas can you imagine bullfights in manila no? at that time so i'm sure the men were uh, the first to flock to these events and of course the natives the indios and the naturales indios and naturales they are always you know always um uh, um you know, uh, keeping their uh, their roosters, the men are keeping their roosters next to themselves because they are, you know, preparing these roosters to fight. And so you would have cock fights and of course gambling. So these are forms of entertainment, but they can also be vices. No? But these are uh, what makes life in, in Manila quite interesting. No? And towards the end of the Spanish colonial period, already towards the end 1897 the cinema arrived but these are silent films it had no sound they are not colored and they are very short and it was in escolta where the first uh, movies 
silent movies were shown. So these are the forms of entertainment, and this is the, the kind of everyday life that people, uh, people had. But uh, it would not be complete if I don't mention an, a very important event which everybody looks forward to every day in Manila. And what is that? That is the Paseo. What is the Paseo? The Paseo is the place where everybody, uh, in, in Tagalog, we say pasyal. But in, um, in Spanish, it's pasear. And that's where the term comes from. Pasyal comes from pasear, no? to pass, to, to uh, actually to walk. But then some people choose to use uh, their carriages, their horse carriages, to go around uh, the paseo. And so everybody in the afternoon, especially in the late afternoon when it is not so hot, the sun is not so hot anymore, especially if there's a breeze uh, uh, flowing and cooling everybody, people go to what they call the moon shape, the moon shaped area or what they call the lunette. That's why eventually in Spanish it came to be called luneta, no? Luneta. So there everybody who is anybody goes for a pasear, you know? Huh? So they walk, they, uh, they uh, talk, they meet uh, people, they meet uh, the person they're interested in, they do business, they, chi they chisme chismear, they, uh, they um, um, you know, they talk about everybody else, no? Everybody from the governor general to the archbishop, you would see the most important people and of course, uh, the ordinary people doing uh, the paseo. This is the paseo in outside uh, Intramuros, which is done uh, around uh, the area which is called now as Luneta. And at the at the uh, at sundown, everybody stops. Everybody stops. And what do they do? They say the angelus. The bells of all the churches would toll. That signals the beginning of the angelus, and then the whole crowd stops and uh, bows and prays the whole angelus until, of course, the end. And then the bells would ring again, and then the paseo is over. Everybody goes home. No, some goes, some go to the theater, others to go to a party, others to meet a business. Uh, you know, um, a business partner, others would go home, but that's the paseo. And this is a major activity in Manila. So these are the things that make life in old Manila quite interesting, don't you think so? But then why is why should we study old Manila? Very, very simple. Number one, because Manila is the site of one of the most important uh, events uh, towards the end of the Spanish colonial period. And what is that? I will only give one example, and this is the execution of Dr. Jose Rizal. Dr. Jose Rizal, even at that time when he was executed uh, in, December, in, uh, in December 30, on December 30 of 1896, was already considered uh, heroic by so many people. And so uh, the focus on Rizal was very, very intense. And this actually was already part of the outbreak of the revolution. So if the Spaniards thought that, that by executing Rizal, they are actually uh, putting down the revolution or uh, preventing the revolution from spreading, actually it had the opposite effect. And uh, the death of Rizal signaled, uh, signaled uh, that there is no going back. The road towards independence, the road towards the revolution, is uh, said, and there is no looking back until the proclamation of independence on June 12, 1898. And uh, because uh, Manila is the capital, and it is the site of so many historic events, social, cultural, political, economic, um, as I said before, the significance of Manila is timeless. It will never become irrelevant. People, political leaders have threatened to change the capital of the Philippines. I think uh, the current administration wanted to move the capital to another place, but I think they're missing a very important point. The strategic location of Manila plus 
all the history that is part of uh, Manila can never be replaced. And this is the main major reason why we should, we should actually uh, study Manila as best as we can. Now, uh, for those who are teachers watching this uh, short lecture, uh, you can see all of these photographs, all of these maps, which I have uh, um, shown briefly in uh, the book of, uh, in the second edition of Carlos Quirino's Old Manila, which I am honored to have edited for Vibal Publications. If you want to learn more about all these things that I told you, because what I, I told you is only a small part of the very large uh, amount of information, then, uh, and if you want to see, look at more pictures, there are so many pictures, then you should try to get yourself a copy of Old Manila. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed uh, this lecture as much as I enjoyed, you know, recollecting Old Manila, the glory that was Old Manila. Thank you very much.